Roy Halladay, the baseball legend who grew up in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, died today at the age of 40 when his small plane crashed off the coast of Florida. He was the best starting pitcher to ever come out of Colorado. Since he was a little boy, Roy Halladay loved two things, airplanes and baseball. You could see he was going to be special. I mean, he threw harder than anybody we had. He was a little bit wild, but you could tell there was something special there. Take it from someone who knew. Roy Halladay was something special. His father knew it, built him a batting cage in his basement in Arvada, where a five-year-old's first throws through a tire built the foundation for a career that the Hall of Fame should consider. And it's sad to say it's a friend of ours. It's, it's Roy Halladay. Many know Roy as a Cy Young winner, future Hall of Famer, one of the best pitchers to ever pitch in the game of baseball. Um, we know Roy as a person. Take it from someone who knew. Roy Halladay was something special. Baseball was good to him, and Halliday was good to the communities he called home. I could speak as somebody who knew him. He was a part of our sheriff's office. His kids went to school with some of our kids. He was there whenever we needed him. Doc Halliday, the fans called him. Call Doc at the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, and a canine will come running. The dog purchased for the department by Halliday. At Arvada West, his name is written on the baseball field and spoken proudly by generations of students who benefited from his generosity. Being a pilot, flying planes, that was his passion. A passion young Roy got from his father, a commercial pilot. The man who raised him to love two things, airplanes and baseball. Both took him around America, leaving behind people who knew Roy Halliday was something special. He was one in a million. It is a true loss for us. Roy Halladay was so dominant in the majors, it's easy to forget there was a time when his career fell apart and he built it back up, relearning a new way to pitch. I recommend that you read a beautifully written Sports Illustrated piece, Tom Verducci's What Makes Roy Run. It chronicles how he feared coming home to Colorado as a failure when he was demoted to the minors and how his unmatched preparation and training rebuilt his career. It also details the role of his wife, Brandy, another Coloradan, in shaping that comeback. We have a link to the SI piece on the next Facebook page. We're hearing tonight from the gun dealer in Colorado who sold weapons to the church shooter in Texas. Let us be immensely clear, there is nothing to suggest that this gun store owner did anything wrong. As we told you last night, the Air Force did not properly report the shooter's domestic violence conviction to the national database. So that means when the shooter came into specialty sports and supply in Colorado Springs in 2014-2015, there was nothing amiss with his background check when Jeff Lepp ran him through NICS, the National Instant Background Check System. You're eating dinner with your family and your friends, and all of a sudden you got to stand up and say, hey, uh, apparently we sold a gun that belonged to a guy who just committed a mass murder in Texas. My wife was like, oh my God, you know, the, you know what are you going to do? I mean, he, how do you actually respond to something like that other than your stomach sinks and you're like, you got to be kidding me. Well, the culpability really in this isn't so much on Nix as it is on the Air Force for not transferring it. If they had transferred it, there's no way Nix would have ever allowed this to, to go through. But they didn't have that information. So in their eyes, there was nothing wrong with this. There was nothing wrong with him. It turns out there was a great deal wrong with him. Let us add to the list of missing warning signs with this shooter, which already included animal abuse, beating his wife, fracturing the skull of a child. Add to that the fact that he made death threats against his superior officers in the Air Force. Death threats that we learned today landed him in a mental health institution in New Mexico, which he then escaped and was recaptured. That was in 2012. With nothing on his record, he would go on to purchase four guns in the following years and kill 26 people in a church last Sunday. That shooting knocked news of the Thornton Walmart shooting out of the national headlines just three days after it happened. It was last Wednesday, seems like ages ago. Tonight, one of the three victims of that shooting will be honored by friends and family in North Glen. Carlos Moreno was 66. The man with the big smile and the generous heart who kept the Auraria campus running, working in the facilities department for 16 years. A man of faith, presumably. It's his family, wife, three daughters, grandchildren, and others will say the rosary for him tonight before his funeral mass tomorrow morning, 1030, Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic Church in North Glen. Moreno's funeral is open to all who wish to attend. We haven't heard the same for the other victims of the shooting. We know that Pam Marquez's funeral is scheduled for tomorrow afternoon in Denver. If we hear about services for Victor Vasquez, we'll let you know. 
RTD is outlining a pretty dire prediction as it tries to keep the A-line running. RTD is asking state regulators for a new hearing that could allow them to remove the gate crossing attendants, the guys who are still stationed at each crossing. RTD wrote, a continuing requirement for the use of flaggers at A-line at grade crossings will make operation of the A-line unsustainable. Unsustainable. As in, help us approve this plan or we will run out of money for the flaggers and have to shut the A-line down. State regulators will decide Thursday morning whether to hold a new hearing on this. RTD just wants permission for the gates to stay down as long as they are currently staying down, which is slightly longer than what regulators approved. If RTD gets the all clear, then they can make some progress on removing the flaggers. That step has to happen before the train's horns can go silent, as was planned for long ago. For the first time in eight years, it is an election day in Colorado with no statewide issue on your ballot. So unlike a presidential election year when 75% or so will vote, this year is more of a meh. We're expecting 30% turnout. So we asked politics guy Brandon Ritterman, who wins when most voters don't vote? The proverbial book says low turnout's better for conservatives, or at least that it gives them an edge. One reason why, age. The conservative base has a lot of people who've lived here a long time and do not miss a single election, while liberals generally rely on votes from younger people who move more and are less inclined to dive into the nuances of a local school board race than they are a run for president. Low turnout can also be better for the side that's got money. It's cheaper to buy TV ads in an odd year. But even campaigns that don't do that can usually afford to send you something in the mail. Sometimes hearing from one side, and not at all from the other, is enough to tip it. Which brings us to hustle. Which side worked the pavement harder? I've had a few city council candidates show up on my doorstep. How about you? You'd be surprised how far a five-minute chit-chat with a voter can go when one side made the effort and the other didn't. If you have not voted yet and you are watching this program live at 6 p.m., go now. Polls are open until 7 o'clock. To quote the newsman Bob Schieffer, quoting his late mother, vote. It will make you feel big and strong. Our next question is about a shortage of saline IV fluid. Mia works in a hospital. She said she heard it was related to the hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico. Surprised it wasn't on the news. A next viewer named Pam says she has an autoimmune disorder and gets regular saline infusions, but only got half as much last time. She asked, any chance you could get the real story? So FDA confirms to us there is indeed a saline shortage. There's been one since 2014. It did get worse after the hurricanes hit Puerto Rico because it's home to a big production plant pumps out a lot of saline. The FDA says that it's been importing saline from Ireland and Australia to try and make up for what was lost in production in Puerto Rico. Locally here, UC Health referred to minor measures being take to, taken to conserve saline at its hospitals. A spokesperson said that pill versions of medications are being used instead of the IV versions when possible. Last night here, we asked you a simple yet somewhat difficult question. In these days, this current news environment, what gives you hope? We were astonished by the number of responses, hundreds of them. The answer to the question, what gives you hope? We know we shared some of it last night. We'll highlight more throughout this newscast. Ski tickets for less than $10. I mean, what did the ski area think was going to happen? I would be lying if I didn't say we were caught a little off guard. Now they have to figure out how to get a massive crowd onto the mountain. The sky reminded us today winter is coming right after fall. There's more fall, like seriously, later this week, so calm down, everybody. And remembering a man who dedicated his life to building Five Points as a center of African-American life in Denver. Next. Throwback prices on lift tickets for Aspen Snowmass's 50th anniversary seemed like a good idea. Then about 12,000 people snatched up the opportunity to go skiing for $6.50. So uh, Aspen, now what? It's December 15th, uh, so it's still pretty early in the season for us. We are not a, a typical drive market for Denver. You know, you've got to pass a, a number of other resorts before you get here. Um, so uh, most of our business is destination business, people that are flying in. 
Um, we certainly have some some front range and some Denver business, but but to have that number of people on December fifteenth for us is is a, a, a surprising occurrence in a in a in a good way. So now they know they're going to have a very serious overcrowding problem on that day and some pretty long lift lines. So bring your ideas, Aspen. So far, they're going to do some bands to keep people entertained. They're going to set up s'more stations so that people have something to do and a way to keep their bellies full and their minds occupied while the lines are long. And I have a feeling that if you have a suggestion, they'd welcome it. Not a lot of snow in Denver, certainly not enough to ski on. I bet you were sliding around on the freezing drizzle in the layer of ice from today's storm. But up high in areas like Winter Park, they love this storm. Heavy snow up to a foot in Estes Park. And now more light snow coming into Denver tonight and freezing rain before we're done with this system. They kept temperatures in the 30s for most of the afternoon. Actually, that high of 36, we hit at midnight. Snow showers coming in, banded precipitation, but the only advisory out, winter weather advisory for the southern mountains, and that cancels out in a few hours after a couple more inches of accumulation. Cold air starting to scour away, high pressure moving in, and that means after a round of light snow, freezing fog, drizzle tonight, skies clear. We drop into the teens and then nothing but blue tomorrow. Lots of sunshine and a warming trend to go along with all of that sun. And so 19 tonight when skies clear out. Tomorrow morning when skies clear, we'll jump from 19 into the mid 40s, mid 50s for high temperatures, a trend that continues right into the upcoming weekend. Only storm we're tracking this week, so you've basically made it through the worst weather of the week and outside right now tough go on the roadways out there with that freezing fog and drizzle tonight be careful i'm here with bev marquez who heads colorado crisis services we're going to bust some myths about mental health mm -hmm. here today colorado crisis services have people who are standing by 24 7 365 by phone or by text they're not going to pass you off they're not going to take a message they're there to help you solve your issues in real time you'll see that number on the screen and you can also find it on the next facebook page let's talk about some myths myth one you're weak or you're crazy if you seek help this is about more than that people want to be private. People think that there's something wrong with having concerns about their behavior or the way that they're thinking. And just as in a medical condition, it's not our expertise to know necessarily how to fix ourselves. So going to talk to somebody is, um, it will expedite feeling better. It's the right thing to do. And treatment works. Myth number two, you can't do anything to prevent a mental health crisis. Talking about it is a huge source of prevention and problem solving in the moment, breaking it up in pieces so that it doesn't get too big and so that it doesn't get away from us. Why do you think there's such a disconnect about keeping our minds healthy? Yeah. I think that we don't, we don't grow up talking about the importance of that or knowing how to do that. We've just been talking about it, you know, in the last five to maybe 10 years. And I think that it's a, it feels like in its an admittance of something being wrong with me. Myth number three, people with mental illness are dangerous. Yeah. Because it is such a private or non-conversation for people. And then when we do end up seeing it, it's tied to uh, maybe a story about a violent uh, behavior, that that's kind of the only discussion that there is, then we are going to walk away with those conclusions. I think, however, the reality is that one in four of us live with a mental illness. and. Um, People living with a mental illness are contributing members to society that are that are um, mostly very, very peaceful and not dangerous. Ben Marquez, thank you for the work that you and your folks do. Thanks for coming by for a conversation. Thank you. Even into his 90s, Norman was a fixture of five points. Clear across Colorado, another nonagenarian is leaving his mark in one particular spot. And the most Colorado thing we saw today, Boulder giving free stuff to cyclists. Next. Norman Harris Sr. came home to Colorado from World War II and ran businesses and apartment buildings in Denver's Five Points neighborhood. Do anything well enough for long enough, and your passing one day will be noted as a great loss to the community. Five Points, Denver, all of Colorado.
lost Norman Harris Sr. last week at the age of 99. That's the heartbeat of the community. Mr. Harris was the heartbeat of the community. Norman Harris Sr., he commanded a lot of respect. People really honored my grandfather. I mean, this entire block is Mr. You know, Mr. Harris, it's the whole piece. And it's going to be hard to, you know, pass this building and, and uh, think about, you know, Mr. Harris not being here. He died just this past Friday. He was 99. One of his biggest contributions to the community was that particular building on 26th and Welton. He was not only a businessman, but he was also a part of the, the cultural fabric of the Five Points. He loved the Five Points. There was quite a bit of prestige that a, a person had by owning a business and owning a property on Five Points. So he will be celebrated not only as a businessman, not only as a cultural historical icon, but also someone who um, helped create the country that we're living in through his military service. He never gave up. He chased his dream. He's, he, he's a big dreamer. With the passing of Mr. Harris, it is almost as if the closing of an era has occurred in this community. No matter what happens to you, no matter what obstacle you face, no matter who tells you you can't do it, there's a way. My grandfather's life was, was, was a testament to that. Normus and Norman Harris Sr.'s funeral will be held one week from today. It's in Five Points at Taylor Mortuary at 11 o'clock. Anyone who knew him is welcome there. The most Colorado thing we saw today involves Boulder and bikes and things being handed out for free. City's Lighten Up Boulder program is handing out free lights to cyclists so they comply with Boulder code. You can have a white light up front, red reflector and back dawn to dusk rather than hand out tickets. They're going to hand out lights. If you've missed the giveaway, there are three more. There are details in the next section of 9news.com. A note for anybody who's following national politics on this election day, probably the biggest race in America is that for governor in Virginia and the Associated Press is calling it early for the Democrat, Ralph Northam, over the Republican candidate Ed Gillespie, who made a late push banking on resentment among working class voters over immigration and economics. AP calls the Virginia race for governor for the Dem. We're back in a moment with things that give us hope and honor for two special people, old and young. Next. As we read every one of your hundreds of responses to the question, what gives you hope? Here's what gives us hope. That. The fact that an artist built a bench for 92-year-old Robert Wilson. A bench to sit on at his favorite fishing spot at Maroon Lake. The place where he has gone for more than 60 years to fish. To teach his children, his grandchildren, and his great-grandchildren how to fly fish. The artist added a plaque with a poem. Rest, restore, revel in grandeur. Possess the treasured moment. No. You are the keeper of the pristine. Our recommendation here last Friday was an invitation to send Christmas cards to a nine-year-old named Jacob. He lives in Maine. He's fighting neuroblastoma and aggressive cancer, and his family knows his time is limited. He may not have another Christmas, so they are celebrating early this upcoming weekend at the hospital. Jacob wanted Christmas cards. Today, our friends in Maine told us he has received 30 cartons full from all across the country. Guarantee you look through, you find some from Colorado. About 35,000 cards from all across America. Nightly writes in tonight, haven't caught next in a while. Why do you have a tie on? Either A, the stories today seemed like something that required a tie, or B, I'm a tool of management. You can find out next time.